So welcome everyone to the next IITE seminar and today it is my great pleasure to welcome Mark McPeak from Dartmouth College who is going to be talking to us about the role of mutualism in coexistence. So I'm not even going to talk anymore about that. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Gary. Thanks for inviting me and thanks everybody for showing up. Um, this is a collaborative talk that I want to talk to you about two different mechanisms of coexistence that mutualists may foster. So, and one of my actual co-authors is actually on the Zoom with us here, Judy Bronstein. So, oh, why is it not advancing? There. So my entire career has been spent worrying about how enemies of things foster coexistence among the things that they're enemies of. So there's lots of things that have diseases, that have herbivores, that have predators, but in the, and it's pretty easy to understand why something that is an enemy of resource competitors can foster the coexistence of those resource competitors, right? If we assume that one species of consumer would outcompete another species of consumer for a prey in the absence of the predators or enemies, right? What has, we know what has to be true is the enemy has to inflict greater mortality on the better competitor. So then you end up, so it decreases the abundance of that consumer. And so the other consumer can make it in the system because there's enough prey left over for it, right? Very simple. And we've known this since Bob Payne did his famous experiments. Well, the last four or five years, I've gotten very interested because of colleagues of mine in the role of mutualists in fostering coexistence. And it's true that almost every species interacts with mutualists. And as Judy, or my, one of my co-authors, has described in her book, there are basically three different mechanisms of mutualist, mutualistic interactions between species. There's one category that Judy calls transportation mutualists, which are things like pollinators that move pollen between flowers. There are protection mutualists, where one species protects its mutualist partner from enemies. And there are nutritional mutualisms, Things like mycorrhizae, giving um, nutrients to plants and helping them get along with one another. So what I've always been, what I'm interested in, what I want to talk to you about today is when can a mutualist actually foster coexistence among hosts? And if you think about it, mutualists are increasing the abundances of these, of their partners. And so they, in some sense, you might think they'd exacerbate competitive interactions between species. And I want to talk to you about two specific mutualist mechanisms. One is pollinators. And if you're interested in more detail on this, Judy Bronstein and Sarah McPeak and I published a paper in 2022 in Oikos on this, what I'm going to tell you about today. And I had another paper accepted a couple of weeks ago with a colleague of mine here at Dartmouth, Caitlin Hicks Priest, on the mechanisms of how mycorrhizae may foster plant coexistence. So let's talk about pollinators first. <clears throat> so my co-author is Sarah McPeak, who also so happens to be my daughter. And you can ask me why I struck up a, co a collaboration with my daughter at the end of this, if you want. And with Judy, we built a model where we said, what if we assume two plant species? Plant species one is the better competitor for, this, for a soil nutrient, phosphorus, nitrogen, and throughout this talk, all you have to remember is plant species one is the better resource competitor in the absence of the mutualist. <clears throat> oh, so we followed, we built a model where we modeled the soil nutrient dynamics, plants feeding on those soil nutrients to make more plants, but the plants also producing nectar on each plant individual to, to feed a pollinator that interacts with these two plant species. So we came up with a very, you know, it's actually is a very simple model of basically consumer resource interactions across these six dynamic variables. And let me just walk very quickly through these equations with you, just so you get an idea about how the model structured. So soil nutrients <coughs> dynamics are basically, there's a simple renewal, soil renewal function or term at the beginning where T sub N is the total amount of soil nutrient that can accumulate in the absence of all the plants. And then the plants feed on this soil nutrient basically with just a saturated, standard saturating functional responses. 
<clears throat> the plant dynamics we've built into this have it so that the amount of soil nutrient a plant takes up defines the rate at which they produce unfertilized ovules to make new plant babies. Those ovules get fertilized by interacting with the plant. So we assume that each plant species has some minimum fraction of its unfertilized ovules that are fertilized by some other processes like selfing. And all the ovules that are left over <clears throat> are available for the pollinator to, um, to fertilize. And the more pollinators there are, we assume, the greater the fraction of ovules that get pollinated. The plant also has an intrinsic death rate, and we've also built in a cost to producing nectar, which I'll describe this function for you in just a second. So each plant, we also model the amount of nectar produced by each individual plant. The plant produces nectar <clears throat> at some rate according to this term in, in its dynamic equation, where Z sub NPR is the rate, uh, the maximum rate of nectar, the maximum nectar production rate. So I'll say it so you can remember what the acronym stands for. And it fills up with nectar up to the point of ZRV, which means RV stands for reservoir volume. So it's the reservoir, the size of the reservoir the plant can hold giving you the, the maximum amount of nectar the plant can offer to pollinators. And then pollinators simply forage for the nectar off each plant individual according to a standard saturating functional response. And then the population dynamics of the pollinator is just how much nectar it eats and converts into pollinator babies, and it has some intrinsic death rate associated with it. <clears throat> so let's think about this interaction. First of all, what does it take for the pollinator to coexist with just one plant species? Well, in this model, since we're assuming the pollinator only, only feeds on the nectar of a plant, the plant needs to make some minimum amount of nectar to support the pollinator population. So on the x-axis of this graph, I've got ZRV, which is the reservoir volume for plant species one, which is the maximum amount of nectar that plant could offer to the pollinator. So there's some minimum value and the, the lines show you the equilibrium abundances of <clears throat> the nutrient, the plant, the pollinator, which is the plant is the green line, the pollinator is the blue line and the nectar equilibrium nectar volume is the orange line at the bottom. <clears throat> so there's a minimum amount of nectar that the plant has to produce to support the pollinator population. And as the pollinator, if the plant makes more nectar, pollinator abundance increases because its food supply increases. And because the pollinator abundance increases, you get more plants because more ovules are fertilized. <clears throat> so now let's think about what it takes for to get a second plant species in here into this little simple food web. So to think about this, what we have to do is think about the plant isoclines. So this shows a three-dimensional graph of pollinator uh, abundance on the z-axis, P, uh, nutrient availability, the n-axis in the front, and then the plant abundance, the R1, on the right axis. In the absence of pollinators, the plant's going to drive soil nutrients down to some level, which is effectively their R star in the absence of the pollinator, which defines their competitive ability when the pollinator is not there. But as we increase pollinator abundance, the isocline of this plant bends towards the, the pollinator axis or the pollinator face because the plant is now having more ovules fertilized by the pollinator. And so it can then drive soil nutrient abundances lower because it has a higher birth rate when there are more pollinators. But it asymptotes at the point where all of the ovules of that plant are, are fertilized. For these two plants to coexist, their isoclines have to cross. What that means is that one plant has to be a better competitor in the absence of the pollinator, but the other species, the poorer competitor in the absence of the pollinator, has to, number one, be more pollen limited than the first species. And number two, has to receive a greater benefit from interacting with the pollinator. 
So that means it has a sharper curve in that isocline so that the two isoclines cross. Now, what also has to be true is all the other, to figure out where the equilibrium is, we have to worry about all the other four isoclines in this. The two that are really critical are the pollinator isocline, which is the blue line, and the, new, the soil nutrient isocline, which is the sort of yellow line. And it's, they have to cross in the plant R1, R2 subspace. Now, the pollinator isoclines intersect the plant axes at the point where the, plant, the pollinator can support a population at that, with only that plant present. Okay, is this clear? So let's think about two scenarios. First of all, so in through, as I said, through all this, R1 is going to be the better resource competitor. <clears throat> let's consider a situation where R2, the second plant species, cannot support the pollinator on its own. So, and what I've showed you here are the equilibrium abundances of all six players in the system. And the x-axis is the reservoir volume of plant species one, the better competitor. And so that's how much nectar the better competitor can offer to the pollinator. At some point, the pollinator comes in <clears throat> to the system, but it still may not have enough nectar left over to support or plant species two. But if we increase reservoir volume just a little more to 0.15 on this axis, now plant one and the, the nectar produced by plant two here is enough total to have plant to have a pollinator abundance high enough so that plant species two can make it in the system. So what's happening is the isocline for the pollinator is decreasing on R1, on the R1 axis in the bottom panel as we increase reservoir volume. So if we increase reservoir volume even farther, that isocline intersects the R1 axis at an even lower value. And what that does is it shifts the relative abundances of the two plant species relative to one another. Now, if we think about this situation, the pollinator in this case is a mutualist for R1, for plant species two, because it is allowing plant species two to be in the system with plant species one, but the pollinator is an indirect antagonist for plant species one because it's decreasing the abundance of plant species one because of competition with plant species two. <clears throat> and what's supporting the population here is primarily the nectar produced by plant species one. Now consider the reverse case. So now let's consider a situation where plant species two can support the pollinator on its own without plant species one being present. So in this case, and what I'm showing here is a graph where the x-axis is now the reservoir volume for plant species two, which is the variable we're gonna manipulate here. So it's how much nectar is plant species two also offering to the pollinator. Plant species one, is, remember, is also giving nectar to the pollinator, and it can support the pollinator population by itself. <clears throat> if plant species two offers a very low abundance of nectar or volume of nectar to, to the pollinator, <clears throat> we get both species in the system. But as we increase res the nectar supplied to the pollinator by plant species two, Plant species two eventually can offer so much nectar to the pollinator that it can drive plant species one extinct. So let's think about this situation. So what is required for a pollinator to foster coexistence between two competing plant species is that the poorer competitor in the absence of the predator has to receive primary, the primary benefit from the pollinator, a much sub more substantial benefit from the pollinator but the pollinator population has to be supported primarily by the better competing species, which is the one that does not receive a large benefit from the pollinator. So if you think about that, and if you apply some modeling that Sarah and Judy and I did on the evolution of nectar dynamics in response to pollinators, this makes absolutely no sense, right? The plant species that is getting the primary benefit is the plant species that is not supporting the pollinator. So that species should evolve 
in our other our, our evolutionary models that we've explored, that plant species should increase nectar production because it would get an even greater benefit by supplying more nectar. The plant species that gets very low benefit from the pollinator should evolve to decrease the amount of nectar it supplies to the pollinator because it's not getting very much benefit at all. It's primarily just paying a cost for making nectar. And so evolution in this system should actually reverse these relationships so that plant species two would actually drive plant species one extinct. So even though it is possible to get these two plant species to coexist with one another, it's a very unlikely scenario that the mechanism you need to actually have them be in the system together. So why don't we stop right here? And, and if you all have questions about this, let's talk about this a minute, because then I'll move on to the, the mycorrhizal system. So if you got questions about this right now, why don't we take a couple of minutes and, and talk a little bit? I hate talking by myself in a room by myself anyway. So anybody have any questions? So uh, yeah, if you have any questions, yes, uh, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, Mark, that's really interesting. So it just, yeah, you know, this last point that you're making strikes me as, you know, with competition for two resources, let's say, if you apply optimal foraging arguments, it seems to like lead to coexistence, right? That's kind of the natural outcome. Um, right. But here's the opposite, right? So I guess, what do you think is the essential difference between the two that like here, the sort of individual optimal thing leads to more of the competitive exclusion? Yeah, I think th this is why I actually like doing these kinds of um, issues. I really think mechanism is really critical to understanding how species coexist with one another. And all of these species have, um, you know, conflicting demands on them. And coexistence is not something that's guaranteed in this. And the system does not want the species to coexist. It's just coexistence is just basically the emergent property out of the species properties that exist there. So, you know, if if this was an optimally foraging pollinator, it would only go to plant species one because it's wasting its time on plant species two. If you're in this situation where they're they're initially coexisting with one another. So there's lots of arguments about, you know, if if these results are accurate and just really do describe the mechanisms among them, pollinators probably do not really foster that much coexistence among competing plant species at least in the scenario we've modeled here. Uh, Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy, how are you? Hi, Mark. Uh, greetings from Florida. Uh, oh, excellent. I was just in Tallahassee at Joe Travis's retirement party. So, uh, so, um, so I'm going to ask you the question that I, I feel like if my uh, recently retired colleague, Lawrence Harder, pollination ecologist, Lawrence Harder were here, he would ask you, um, how, do, how do the assumptions in your model kind of line up with what we know about things like uh, the frequency of like pollen limitation versus ovule limitation of plant, repro of plant reproduction? Um, I, not, I, not that the scenario here is, you know, it, I don't think it's a totally implausible one, but just how do you think about like, because we have a lot of experiments on like prevalence of pollen versus like ovule limitation. How does that line up with the scenario you're considering in this model? You'd really have to ask a plant biologist and I would defer, maybe Judy wants to jump in on this, but you know, people tend to, this is the other, the other reason I like working on these mechanistic models is people they put together traits of species that people usually don't study in the same context, right? Pollen limitation, people, people study who study pollination study pollen limitation and attracting pollinators and floral displays and all that sort of stuff and reproductive outcomes, but they don't study the competition of the plants. And people who study plant competition don't study pollination interactions. And so, Part of why I really like doing this is making people think about, okay, you really got to put together different, very disparate sets of traits to actually understand the mechanisms of coexistence here, right? So if you were going to do, if I was going to take this out in the field and do a study on, 
co-occurring plant species, right? I'd need to know what are the competitive relationships among those plant species for whatever nutrients they're competing for. And I need to know what pollinators are coming to them. Are there shared pollinators on them? And what's the degree of pollen limitation in them, right? And the prediction here would be poorer competitor, if the pollinator is actually promoting coexistence, the poorer competing species for soil nutrients should be the ones that are more pollen limited. And so get a greater benefit from that, those pollinators. But, you know, I don't know of any studies where people have put those really disparate sets of traits together, right? People work on, I go out and do my DeWitt replacement series looking at plant competition, or I go out and I bag flowers and I put move pollen around and see how limiting it is. And never the twain shall meet. But somebody should do it. Uh, Washington? Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, what you described is quite interesting. So if I understand you're saying that mathematically you can construct a scenario where a pollinator can foster coexistence, but you don't expect it to arise evolutionarily. Um, right. So I guess I have two, two linked questions. The first one's related to Jeremy's question and your response to that, which is to what extent this can be observed out in the field. And it sounds like you haven't done those studies. Um, but uh, the second question is, would you expect this might be something you could see in the case of an invasive? If you went out and looked, you might not find this in a well-evolved ecology, which has been stable for millions of years, but for you know, a long time. But if you found an invasive species, it might actually be able to enter into this situation where it could take advantage of a plant which was already producing a lot of pollen. So I'm wondering right. if you've thought about looking for it in terms of invasives. Uh, I work on damselflies. So <laughs> at this point, I've just gotten involved with, with do, working um, on these mechanistic models of the interactions. And I haven't really thought about taking it out at all. And I haven't done field work in 10 years. So somebody, I'm trying to encourage my plant ecology buddies to actually do some of this. My daughter's working on, actually working on, on the evolutionary components of these models we've been, we've been building, but yeah, it's, it's, I use it, I think of it more, much more as a sort of signpost that we need to start looking at the organism as a more integrated interactor within the entire community that it finds itself in and not just go, well, I work on pollination, so I don't have to worry about competition. I work on competition. I don't have to worry about pollination, but you're right. The, in, the initial, um, invasive species may be someplace to look at, but you could also imagine the case where the invasive species is actually not a very good competitor, but it actually makes a fair amount of, of nectar and it boosts pollinator abundances to enough. So it's, that may be a component of why an invasive may be driving other plant species extinct. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause it, the, you know, the other, the, the, People who worry about, like me, who worry about coexistence often only worry about the coexistence part about it. And they, we don't think about the flip side of it, which is the competitive exclusion side, right? If you can predict when species coexist, you're also predicting when species are not coexisting with one another and what it takes for them not to coexist with one another. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Judy, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yes, Judy, no, I, jump I, in. I, I think that's actually a great answer that that Mark gave, and it's it's clearly an area in need of a lot of work. But this this issue about invasives is quite interesting because there's certainly field studies that have looked at invasives that share pollinators with native species and have looked at the conditions under which invasives. Um, can establish themselves. So there might actually be um, some field data that are relevant here. And, and based on this discussion, I'm gonna go back and look at some of that. But thanks Somebody very much should, for the comments. Somebody should do that, Judy. <laughs> Anything else about this one? Any other questions? No. Well, let's move on to uh, mycorrhizae. <clears throat> so th in the second part here, this is another paper that, that just got accepted a couple of weeks ago to ecology that um, uh, Caitlin Hicks-Priest, who's a 
associate professor here at Dartmouth with me. Caitlin actually works on mycorrhizal fungi, which is why I brought her in on the paper, because I don't know anything. I know even less about mycorrhizal fungi than I do about pollination. So if you think about the interaction between plants and their mycorrhizal fungal partners, it's a really complicated system. And it's, it's basically just a set series of flows between species and between the soil, right? So what Caitlin and I did was build a model where we have basically the same soil nutrient. We have two plants competing for the soil nutrient. And the two plants also interact with a mycorrhizal fungus. Now for each, in this model, for each plant species, what we have is a variable that describes the dynamics of plant total biomass in the, that species. And then for each plant species, we also model the amount of the quantity of nutrient in a per, in per unit of biomass and the amount of carbon per unit biomass in an individual in, in that plant species. And I want to make the point that <clears throat> Nutrient, the nutrient and carbon we're talking about are the metabolically available quantities. So they're the building blocks of what would end up making biomass. So, it, for example, it would be the pool of glucose in the plant to make cellulose. And so cellulose and hemicellulose would be categorized as biomass and glucose would be count, categorized as carbon. Right. Is that distinction clear to people? I hope. And then we have the same three variables for the fungus. And this model is basically just flows between all of these compartments. So we use exactly the same soil nutrient renewal uh, function to describe soil dynamics. <clears throat> the plants and the fungi take up nutrients from the soil. They harvest nutrients from the soil, again, based on a simple saturating functional response but here what we model is the rate at, of uptake also decreases as the quantity of nutrient in the biomass of the plant or the fungus increases. So if the, if the plant is full of the nutrient, it's, it's not taking up soil nitrogen anymore. So it's just a little complication that we built into this. So if you think about this, that means that both plants and the fungus are resource competitors for the environmental nutrient. Right? It's not just the plants here that are competing for the soil nutrient. It's actually the fungus as well, because it's taking up soil nutrients. So all three of these species are resource competitors with one another. Now, we assume the plants photosynthesize according to a rate where the maximum photosynthetic rate is a function of plant nutrient quality. So the quantity in the plant, we're always symbolizing with this capital Q. The subscript identifies what species it is. And the superscript identifies what, whether we're talking about not, uh, nutrient or carbon. We also assume that the plants <clears throat> decrease their photosynthetic rate as total plant biomass increases. So effectively, they shade one another out and decrease photosynthetic rate. But we, here we assume that the two plants are equivalent competitors for light. So it's not light competition that's fostering their coexistence at all. They're equivalent competitors for light. We also have built a model so that mycorrhizal, the fungus, also can harvest carbon from the soil. But in this, so that would be something like a nectar mycorrhizal species. But for what I'm talking about here, we're just going to assume that the fungus gets all of its carbon from the two plant species. And so what we're talking about in this right now is basically an arbuscular mycorrhizal species. Plants and the mycorrhizae produce biomass according to the multi-compound droop dynamics that we're assuming. So mu is the maximum biomass production rate for each species. And then that rate decreases as the quantity of both nutrient and carbon in the tissues of that individual decrease, right? So in this model, all species are simultaneously nutrient and carbon limited. And so th that may shift given the quantities of those two elements in the tissues of the species. <clears throat> the plants take nutrient from the fungus. This is why they're interacting with this mycorrhizal fungus to get nutrients as a second source 
in addition to taking up soil nutrients. And it's, we have exactly the same dynamics for this, but this also means that both plant species are resource competitors for the fungal nutrient pool. <clears throat> and the mycorrhiza takes carbon from both plant species, right? So this is the standard interaction between mycorrhizal fungal, fungi and plants. The plant supplies the fungus with carbon, the fungus supplies the plant with nutrient. But this means that the fungus is actually mediating apparent competition between these two plant species. So as you can see, there's a really complicated circuitry of interactions between these three species. So just to give you an idea about the full set of the 10 differential equations in this model, here's the equation for the nutrient. The first term is just soil renewal. The next two terms are <clears throat> foraging by the plants and by the fungus for soil nutrients, taking them out of the soil. And the last two terms are a, um, a return of nutrients back into the soil pool when plant biomass and fungal biomass dies. So that's those are proportional to the death rates of each one. So there's there's basically a recycling of carbon and or of night of nutrient back into the soil when plant and fungal biomass dies. For plant biomass, we have the photosynthetic rate is the first term, and they have a standard um, intrinsic death rate. For the nutrient quantity in per unit biomass of each plant, we have the amount they take up from the soil is the first term. The second term is <clears throat> movement of the nutrient out of this pool into the biomass pool. So this is basically just loss of, of glucose in the body or of um, nutrient in the body when it gets incorporated into biomass. And then the last term is taking the nutrient from the fungus. For carbon dynamics within the plants, we have the same thing. We've got photosynthesis, photosynthesis for the first term. The second term is removing carbon from this pool and putting it into biomass. And the third term in that is um, moving carbon, carbon being taken away by the fungus feeding on the plant. And then we have comparable equations for the fungus. So let's think about what the dynamics of this are. So here what I've shown you is, let's first again think about just one plant species coexisting with the fungus, right? What does it take for these two species to coexist? <clears throat> so what I'm showing you here is a figure of where the, the y-axis, the vertical axis is the total amount of soil nutrient available at it for a given environment. And then the, the horizontal axis is the maximum uptake rate of the mycorrhizal fungus taking up nutrient from the soil, right? So it's basically com com competitive ability of the fungus. And this dashed vertical line very near the y-axis is the value of plant species, the maximum rate at which plant species one takes up soil nutrients. And this just shows you the areas where only the plant can is in the system. And then farther on the right are, is the area of parameter space where the plant and the mycorrhizal fungus coexist with one another. And what you take away from this is that for the mycorrhiza to coexist with the plant, the mycorrhiza has to take up soil nutrients at a much higher rate than plants do, right? They're competitors for this soil nutrient and the plants also eating the soil nu the nutrient in the mycorrhiza. So the mycorrhiza has to take up soil nutrients at a much higher rate than the plants do. And that's one of the things that empirically has been demonstrated in real systems. Now we can also think about um, we understand some of the dynamics in this interaction by looking at <clears throat> the abundances of these three variables over a transect, that vertical blue line at 2.5 on the, the row MN axis, right? That is just, we're just gonna run a transect of soil nutrient availability from, very, from zero up to 200. In the right panel, the top panel on the right is the equilibrium abundances of these three entities. So the dashed green line is the abundance 
of the plant species in the absence of the mycorrhizal fungus. And the solid green line is the equilibrium abundance of the plant species in the presence of the mycorrhizal fungus. The red line is the mycorrhiza and the blue line, the blue curve is the soil nutrient availability at equilibrium. So at really low soil nutrient availabilities, the plant increase, gets an increased abundance because of the presence of the fungus, right? It's a mutualist. So the plant has a higher abundance in the presence of the mutualist than it would if the mutualist was absent. But as we increase soil nutrient availability, when we get to very high abundances, the, the mycorrhiza actually becomes a parasite of the plant, decreasing its abundance because mainly it's foraging for carbon from the plant, right? And this is a standard result that people see all the time in field experiments, where at, if, if you augment nitrogen or phosphorus in soils when plants are, compete, are interacting with their fungus, they shift from being mutualists to parasites. This is because if you look in the, in the bottom panel, what I'm showing you are the quantities of nutrient and carbon in the two species. So the solid line, the green lines are for the plant. Um, the solid lines are for the nutrient and the dashed lines are for carbon and the red is for the mycorrhiza. So at low soil nutrient availability, both species are nutrient limited. But as we increase soil nutrient availability to high values, the plant and the mycorrhiza both shift to being carbon limited. So that's what's the shift between being the mycorrhiza being a mutualist to being a parasite on them. <clears throat> now, it is possible for the plant to actually drive the fungus extinct. And the way it drives it extinct is if the plant takes too much nutrient from the fungus. So here what I'm showing you is the vertical axis is the rate, the maximum rate at which the plant species takes soil nutrients up. The horizontal axis is the rate at which plants, the maximum rate at which plant species one takes nutrient from the mycorrhiza. The N M superscript means nutrient from mycorrhizal species. And you can see there's this really just wedge where the two species can coexist with one another. If the plant takes has a too high of a rate of extraction of nutrient out of the mycorrhiza, it will actually drive the mycorrhiza extinct. So you can't just assume that a, a single mycorrhizal species and a single plant species are gonna coexist with one another, right? There's interactions between those two that have to be held true. <clears throat> but the other interesting thing is the rate at which the mycorrhiza, the x-axis here is the maximum rate at which the mycorrhiza takes soil nutrient up. By the mycorrhiza taking up soil nutrients, it increases plant abundance. So standard with the mutualism, the better the, if they can coexist, the better the mycorrhiza taking up soil nutrients, the better it is for the plant because it can now supply more nutrients through that pipeway as well. So let's ask the question now about, let's bring the second plant species in. What does it take to get two plant species in here? <clears throat> so what I'm showing you here are the axes are both Parameter values we're manipulating for plant species one, the vertical axis is soil nutrient uptake rate. The horizontal axis is nutrient uptake rate from the fungus. And the two dashed lines show you the fixed values we're having for plant species two. So you can see this wedge here uh, where the three species coexist with one another, right? What is true about that wedge is that Plant species one is, has, takes up soil nutrients at a higher rate than plant species two does. So we're just, that's just the assumption of plant species one is a better competitor for the soil nutrients. <clears throat> but what is also true in this wedge is that plant species one gets less nutrient from the mycorrhiza. So the micro, plant species two is the better competitor for the nutrient from the mycorrhizal species. So effectively what is required for these two plant species to coexist with one another is one has to be better at extracting nutrient from the environment and the other has to be better at extracting the nutrient from the fungus. 
That is as well something that's very commonly seen in studies of plants and mycorrhizae. The two plants, the rate at which plant species two gets nutrient from the plant determines the relative abundances of those two plants, right? So here what I've shown you is the equilibrium abundances of these four entities in the model, of the abundances of them. And the y or the x-axis is the rate at which plant species two takes nutrient from the mycorrhiza, right? So plant species two gets outcompeted at very low rates of taking nutrients from the fungus, because, but because it, it needs a minimum amount of nutrient from the fungus to actually just be in the system. Once it achieves that, increases in the rate at which it takes nutrients from the fungus, increases its abundance, and decreases the plant the plant one's abundance. But eventually, you shift the changes in relative abundance because that also decreases the abundance of the mycorrhiza. So now there are fewer mycorrhizal, there's less mycorrhizal biomass to feed plant species two, the more plant species two takes nutrients away from the fungus. Now, what's true here though, is that you can increase this rate of taking of plant species two from the fungus to very high values in your name, but the plants will still coexist with one another. You just greatly shift the relative abundances. But in this case, plant species two is a mutualist with the fungus, but plant species one is a paras is or, or the mutualist is a parasite on plant species one. So plant species two is getting a benefit from interacting with the mutualist. Plant species one is getting is a, getting a fitness decrement from interacting with the mutualist, at least in terms of its abundance. And that's a result that's also seen very commonly in in um, field experiments where people compete plants in the presence and absence of fungi. Now here, what I'm showing you is the x-axis is the rate at which the fungus takes up nutrients from the soil. This also influences the relative abundances of those two plant species, but because of the apparent comp competitive interactions between the two plants that's mediated through the fungus, if the fungus has a high enough rate of soil nutrient extraction, it can actually drive the better plant the better competitor in the plant extinct and foster only the poorer comp plant competitor to be present in the system. <clears throat> this is also true for carbon extraction. So here what I've shown you is the same relationships except for the x-axis is the rate at which the fungus is extracting carbon from the two plant species. And here I'm assuming that it's extracting exactly the same amount the, at, exactly the same rate from the two plant species. As you increase carbon extraction rate, you also favor the plant species that has the benefit of interacting with the fungus. And it, the fungus may extract enough carbon from the better competitor to actually drive it extinct in the system. Right, so we cannot assume that this is gonna be coexistence. So what, we've what Caitlin and I have taken away from this is that a mycorrhizal fungus will foster coexistence between two competing plants when one is a better competitor for soil nutrients and the other is a better competitor for nutrients from the fungus. Basically, the fungus becomes a second resource for these plants that they can differentiate on. The plant species that's the better at competing for the nutrient from the fungus always has a mutualistic interaction with the plant. So that means if you grow that plant species in the absence of the other plant, but with the fungus, its abundance will increase as compared to when it's grown without the fungus being present. But the species that is better at competing for the soil nutrient tends to be, have a parasitic relationship with the fungus. Now these two relationships have been shown over and over again in field experiments. So we think our model is actually capturing the mechanism of interactions between these species. And that what we've taken away from this is that interactions with the fungus, with a mycorrhizal fungus, actually fosters coexistence in two different ways. And it actually makes 
coexistence easier for plants because it gives them alternative resources to differentiate on. And there's an apparent competitive in interaction between those plants. So what do we take away from this? I take away from this is pollinator, the interactions with pollinators is probably not fostering coexistence of many plant species with one another. Whereas mycorrhizal fungi probably are fostering coexistence with lots of uh, between lots of plant species, basically because it just sets up yet another limiting factor in the environment that these competitors can differentiate onto. So let me just end by saying what I'm doing now is sort of working my way through Judy's little box of different mutualism interactions. I'm collaborating with a, with a friend of mine who I went to graduate school with, Rob Creed, and one of his graduate students, Brian Brown, on a cleaner mutualism. So crayfish have these, if you look in these in the pictures on the right, in the lower left of this crawdad, they have these little worms on them. And those worms forage alphavooks that grow on the gills of the crayfish. By the worms eating the alphavooks, all the bacteria and algae that grow on top of the gills, respiration rates are higher for the crayfish and they have higher growth rates. <clears throat> and Rob and Brian have been looking at the relationships between an invasive crayfish and the native crayfish in um, the New River in Virginia, where the invasive crayfish has brought in this worm. And it actually turns out that a problem the worm creates is that once it grazes down all the alphooks, it starts eating the gills of the crawdads. So it's both a mutualist at low abundance, but it's a consumer at high abundance. The crayfish, the invasive crayfish has behaviors to knock worms off of them. And so they can keep the abundance of the worms low, but the native crayfish don't have this behavior of cleaning, of knocking the worms off. And they get a great fitness decrement when they get worms on them. So this goes back to the invasive species things we were talking about before. And another project I'm working with is another faculty member here in at Dartmouth <clears throat> is we're looking at, he works on um, bacterial cross-feeding in um, biofilms. And we've started a modeling project looking at how, whether there are mutualistic interactions because of, when do you get mutualistic interactions because of this cross-feeding? And it turns out it's not always that common. So my final takeaway from all this is predation is really simple. It's, my life was really easy until about four or five years ago because it was just like the predator kills the better competitor and they coexist. Cool. Mutualisms are really complicated. And what I would also argue is the mechanism really matters, that you really have to understand the intricate interactions that are going on between these species and how they're benefiting and decrementing the fitnesses of their partners to actually understand when a mutualist would foster coexistence. So with that, let's talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark, uh, for the great talk. So if anybody has questions now, please raise your hand in the chat and I will call on you. Uh, Steve, poking you. Uh, that, that, if you're talking to me, that was a clap, not a raised hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> but Giza has a question. Oh, Giza has a question. Okay. Uh, I like this very much. And uh, um, my question is that if you have uh, more than one uh, kinds of pollinators or more than one kinds of uh, uh, fungi, uh, what will happen? Uh, either it, it is just... Uh, uh, like a uh, single fung uh, 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 fungi and a uh, single uh, pollinator or an arbitrarily large number of uh, uh, fungi or pollinators can maintain an ar uh, coexistence of arbitrarily large uh, plants or what what do you think about this right I, so we we haven't gotten into adding more fungi or more pollinators into the system. So I'm not, my, my intuition would say more fungi means more coexistence because there's more ways to, you can 
basically the way you interact with the species and the way you extract nutrients from the species makes every fungus a separate resource available to all the plants. And it just has to be the case that this plant species has to be better at taking nutrient from this fungus, and this plant species has to be better at taking nutrients from this fungus. Right, so, so basically the fungi are just, you know, you're just adding more resource axes to, into the system for exactly the same nutrient. Pollinators, I'm not so sure of. I've actually been thinking about, um, you know, what would be the interesting questions adding new pollinators in? And Sarah and Judy and I have played around a little bit with optimal with building optimal foraging in for multiple pollinators to see if they would differentiate onto the plants based on feeding habits. Uh, but we haven't really played around with that very much. And my intuition about this is pretty bad at the moment. So hope that helps a little but, bit. Uh, can the plants uh, really distinguish? Distinguish between the different fungi or the fungi uh, di distinguish uh, uh, between the uh, different plants. Well, that, so so number one, the models we played around with so far do not have any of the control mechanisms built in that real plants have with modulating supply of carbon, particularly to mycorrhizal fungi. So this is basically just what would be the properties of a species if it, they were to coexist. But plants have all kinds of mechanisms where they can increase or decrease the flow rate or actually completely get rid of interactions with particular fungi um, that we haven't built into the model yet. Um, for plants, you know, you can imagine situations where there are lots of ways that plants attract different pollinators to them and get different suites of pollinators by what their floral architecture is, what sort of sense they're giving off, what kind of microbiome do they foster in the nectar they're supplying. So you can imagine lots of different ways that the plants could actually differentiate onto different pollinators too, right? And I think that would get much more into multi-species plant communities where you would try to end up with sort of compartments in the community where this small set of plants interact with this small set of pollinators. So that's what fosters their coexistence. These plants are now interacting with these pollinators to get them to coexist with one another. But the plants are differentiated because they're now interacting with different sets of pollinators because of who they're trying to attract, right? So all this, the other interesting thing, why I've always liked community ecology too, is that it becomes this sort of nesting dolls on one another. You can't just, think about one particular interaction, right? And you can't think about just a pair of species because they're embedded in this entire food web and they've got to interact with everybody. Jonas, should I call on people or Gary, you want to call people? By all means, of course. Oh. <laughs> Jonas. All right. uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rob. It's very interesting. So sorry if I missed you explaining this, but in your first like bifurcation diagram of the single plant with the, with the mycorrhiza, uh, you have this like region of only plant one sort of jutting out into the diagram so that you would have like coexistence for low supply and high supply, but not intermediate supply. So I was just kind of curious about what was going on there. Is it like mutualism at the bottom, parasitism at the top, and then like in the middle, you can't work it out. Right. Um, so let me show you this again. So you're talking about this slide here. Right, exactly. So, so sort of at the row M equals 1.5, say, we have like... Right, uh, could, could give this big jut. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so what? why is that? That's that's kind of weird. Well, what happens in the model? So if you look at the abundance relationships for the mycorrhiza, at very low um, nutrient availabilities, the mycorrhizal abundance actually decreases. And it doesn't start increasing, at least at this set of parameters, until you get to a TN value of about 50, and then mycorrhizal abundance increases. But from zero to 50, the mycorrhizal abundance is actually declining. <clears throat> and so if you run a transect from one at, at, at row MN of one vertically, you get the mycorrhizal fungus in this wedge at the very low values of TN, but the abundance of the mycorrhiza declines until it goes extinct. 
and it doesn't oh, okay. come back until you get up to about a TN of about 80, and then it goes up. And that's because at, in that range, the mycorrhiza, for, at least for this example, is so low, is so nutrient limited that its abundance goes down because of competition with the plant. Right. This is where, you know, this is the other issue about all of this is you've got competition and apparent you got resource competition and apparent competition going everywhere. And you get these sort of emergent issues out of it. And I've run this for a, a number of different parameter sets. And you always see this little jutting at sort of intermediate values of TN. All right. And it's basically because of competition for the soil nutrient with the plant. Other questions? Yeah, any other questions? No? Oh, Steve does have a question. Or are you clapping again? No, I'm no. No, this time it's a question. Okay. So after your after your after the first part, I was expecting there to be an evolutionary story at the end of your second part, but there wasn't. Right. So what's going What's going on there? Have you just not done it, or have you concluded that it's not too likely um, to uh, to affect your conclusions from the ecological model? No, I've just started it. Um, so the way all this so my interest in all this started because my daughter Sarah started graduate school in tw in the fall of 2019. And you remember, I remember in the spring of 2020, this big thing happened where nobody could go anywhere. So she had her whole first field season planned out at Mountain Lake Biological Station to go up and start working on a plant pollinator system up on top of the mountain. But the University of Virginia shut the field station down. And so nobody was allowed to go anywhere. So she was stuck in <clears throat> her house in Charlottesville, Virginia for a year not doing anything. So, so we got to talking one day and she was like, well, we could, what can we do on Zoom? Oh, we could do some modeling. And so I said, well, I don't know anything about this. Let's get Judy to help us. So we brought Judy in and the three of us put this model together. And the first two or three papers out of this was the evolution of the plant producing nectar for the pollinator and how they should respond to different pollinators. And then because Sarah's working on a plant that also has produces a lot of toxin, we built in an herbivore and see how they co-evolve with a pollinator and an herbivore at the same time. So then given my interest in all of this, I said, well, wait a minute, let's actually think about coexistence on this too. So I went off and took the, the coexistence part of it through the evolution away because that would make it too complicated and looked at what we talked about uh, at the first part of the talk. And then I got interested in just let's work through all these mechanisms. So then I started on the mycorrhiza and I've just gotten through, we've just gotten through the, the ecological part of it. And I started on the ecological part because my colleague actually works on mycorrhizal fungi in the field. And she was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. So we're just now starting the evolutionary part of it for the, for the fungi. There's also a really cool, I mean, for what mycorrhizal fungi plant people are really interested in are these control mechanisms about the plant turning up the spigot and turning down the spigot of feeding the mycorrhizae carbon. And when they choose to associate or not associate with different kinds of mycorrhizae. So the next, she wants to do the next part about sort of ecological controls on the flows between the species instead of the evolution part. She's not really interested. She's not an evolutionary biologist like me. So she's like, ah, okay, well, whatever. So we'll see where it goes, but we're still working on it. Great. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I'm wondering about what people but maybe are thinking I can ask something a very generic question, but uh, I guess this comes up all the time. So one can ask this question almost all, always. But in this case, because you emphasized how idiosyncratic the phenomenon is, I guess it's a bit more critical, maybe how robust are the results to some of the model assumptions. And also, for example, have you always seen that this model, which is quite complicated, 
uh, does it always converge to a fixed point? Are there regions of parameter space when something else happens? Yeah. There's um, very, very limited areas where you see cycling or, and we've never really seen alternative um, equilibria pop out of it. So, you know, we do consistent runs of, let's just start everything at random initial abundances and see where it goes to. And I've never found alternative equilibria in either one of them. In the mycorrhiza model, at these transition zones, you do get some cycling that happens in it, but it, it's in very narrow ranges of parameter space. Um, the other ones that we, we've started working on, you know, I haven't really played around with them enough to know <clears throat> those issues that pop out at it, but they seem to be, this seems to be pretty robust in the, you know, Caitlin was very happy with the, the results for the mycorrhiza model because basically we can pull experiments out of the literature that says, oh, we can now explain this where we weren't able to explain it two years ago before we did this. You know, one of the assumptions is all, you know, the naive assumption is, well, the plant's getting nutrients from the mycorrhiza. They're clearly they're mutualists because the, the nutrients supply in it, but you get this parasitism effect. And so now we can actually predict when you would get end up with parasitism or not. Turns out that um, our buscular mycorrhizae are found in plant communities that have higher abundances. So they're the ones that only take carbon from the plants and they can't forage for carbon from the environment, like ectomycorrhizal fungi can. <clears throat> Turns out that the area of parameter space where you can get two species to coexist is larger if the fungus cannot forage for carbon from the environment. So maybe that has something, that says something about bringing in more plant species and what it takes for the properties of the species to be able to foster, you know, in greater diversity than just two among a plant assemblage. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Uh... <laughs> Shu Liang, you, you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks, Mark. It's a very interesting talk. And I'm wondering, well, it seems like from your work, it seems like the, the role of the species would change along the gradient of the uh, food availability. Like it can become from shifting from the competitor to like the mutualists or the competitor. And, then, right. and also, I, I know you have a work on like the intraspecific competition, but uh, I'm wondering like if you incorporate this uh, intraspecific competition in these kind of mechanistic models, would that affect some like what kind of impact would would would, would it be on these uh, uh, conclusions? Right. Um, well, if you if you in these models, if you build in intraspecific competition, it makes it much easier for the plants to coexist with one another. Um, for me, this is really more of a theoretical exercise of actually fundamentally understanding what different types of species interactions are doing, <clears throat> right? So, so I basically always set these questions up to say, here are two species that cannot coexist with one another in the absence of interacting with this species. It's impossible for them to do it. And I know which one's going to win. And I want to figure out if I add this type of interaction with these two species that cannot coexist in the absence of this one, what are the characteristics of the interaction with this new introduced species that will allow it? Right. So in that case, it's sort of fundamental to actually getting the next species into the system. Right. It's sort of the it's sort of the limiting factors. So Giza and Georgiou and I were talking before most people came on about limiting factors. So I'm, I want to understand what are, how does a species become a limiting factor for another species? So I had a paper a long time ago that showed that you can get all kinds, you can get any number of competitors to coexist with one another on a single resource if each one of them has experiences some degree of self-limitation. 
So you don't need anything else to explain why you get five competitors on one resource. But if you leave out the, the self-limitation, right, what you end up with is, is um, Sila Venn's insight from 1970 that the number of species you can have on a particular trophic level is, is defined by the number of limiting factors below and above it. So the number of consumers you can have in a system are, is defined by the number of resources they feed on and the number of predators plus the number of predators that feed on them. So if you get two, res two consumers can coexist in a model with one resource and one predator. But now that you got two, two, resource two consumers, you can now add a second predator to the system because they can differentiate onto the two feeding on the two consumers. But once you get two consumer or once you get two predators, now you can add a third consumer. So now you can have three in the middle, two on the top and one on the bottom. And if you start adding species like this, right, at any particular trophic level, you're predicting how many limiting factors below and above are there in the food web. And that's defining the, the diversity you can have at any particular trophic level. So that's the kind of issues that I've been working through for the last 10 years in doing all this modeling. In fact, if you read my, I'll put a selfless plug in for my 2022 Princeton monograph, which is basically taking, a, the premise of the book is to say, if we start with a completely abiotic ecosystem with no species in them, and we start adding species one by, at a time, how can we build a multi-trophic level, multi-species at each trophic level food web with mutualist consumers, predators, plants, diseases, and how does that influence diversity and patterns of that community colleges are interested in? Okay, thanks. Oh, so so my I haven't played around with interest specific competition here because I see it as actually cheating, right? <laughs> Because uh, yeah, they're already going to co coexist with one another, so the mutual isn't really do anything. Yeah, but uh, I'm also wondering, like, probably if you had this uh, this interest specific competition, maybe the the value of the supply rates or the food resource availability would be would change the the role of the the mutualist. So, like. At what value it will become the mutualist or the competitor? Then right. this intraspecific competition, the strength of this intraspecific competition, would change that value or the right. threshold, the boundary. Yeah. Okay. Thank no, you. I think you. I think you're exactly right about that. Oh, thank you, and and also thanks for bringing up the book, which I very much enjoyed. Uh, but uh, Liz has something to say about this. Uh, yes, uh, I also liked it very much, uh, uh, your talk, uh, and uh, because of uh, uh, two reasons uh, were this very interesting for me. Uh, one is that you emphasize that there are many traits, individual traits, which are uh, not measured uh, just because there is not a model or a, a, a basic view uh, which uh, uh, makes uh, uh, researchers uh, to put together uh, the complete picture and measure those things uh, which are decisive if you look at the mechanism of competition. So that was one, one thing. The, uh, and uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, that it is that you, ex if I understand well, then you very explicitly uh, uh, measure uh, model the feedback loops, and uh, and uh, and the basic result uh, is, and please correct me if I am not right, that these feedback loops must differ in order to uh, to coexist uh, for uh, for the species. So if you uh, make such an explicit. Uh, uh, modeling of uh, of the feedback loops regulation loops uh, uh, of the uh, populations uh, modeled then uh, then uh, it's uh, it's uh, evident that you must take into consideration the individual traits uh, which determine the interaction between the the species and get down to the to the to the individual level and uh, therefore uh, you may uh, say that, okay, that's what the uh, uh, field of biologists uh, uh, see. So my question is that uh, 
that you start from specific models and then uh, you get uh, general results which are uh, somehow self-evident, uh, at least if I am right uh, to me. And uh, uh, why uh, why don't you use the language of uh, niche segregation, uh, separation of feedback loops? Because actually this is what you uh, expect. Uh, uh, that there will be so so the whole language uh, could be uh, get nearer uh, to the field biologists uh, who uh, usually think uh, in these terms much more uh, than uh, theoretical ecologists who are uh, um, nowadays uh, uh, with the widespread uh, popularity of the uh, modern coexistence theory. Uh, just uh, getting extremely technical and getting uh, very far from the from the reality. So uh, I am I am very 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 impressed and glad. And I am asking you whether why don't you use that language also? Um, it, it, it's sort of second nature for me. Um, so I actually don't really think about the language I use that much. I, if you've, if anybody's read the book, read that book I mentioned, um, you'll notice that chapter 10 is a takedown of modern coexistence theory. And the primary problem I have with modern coexistence theory is that, and the application of it is, if it can predict whether species are coexisting, the only thing it can predict is whether the species are coexisting. And the whole premise of, the, of this monograph I wrote was to ask the question, why are these species coexisting with one another? Yes, yes, yes. Right? Yes. I, to me, so so uh, I think Bob was on here before. Bob Holt and Matthew Leibold and I have a paper now that sort of, we did a bunch of simulations of multi-trophic level food webs and applied modern coexistence theory to the results and asked the question, will modern coexistence theory predict which species are coexisting or not? And in our simulations, it's not really that good either at it just predicting who coexists with one another. My background, I started this in, um, right, like I said, working on damselflies that both compete for resources and are fed on by predators. And so I actually came up in behavioral ecology and got interested in community ecology because it was basically, I started working on what at the time we called the growth predation risk trade-off that species face. If you're good at taking up resources, yeah, those yeah. are usually traits that make you bad at getting away from predators because they make you more conspicuous. And so I fundamentally think about the traits of species, number one, how those influence their performance capabilities in interacting with other species and how those performance capabilities then shape whether they can coexist with those species or not, right? This prey can live with this predator because it can, you know, this gazelle can live with this cheetah because it can run a little faster than the cheetah can. And so it usually gets away. So that's this prey species that coexists with it. But if you had an antelope species that's really slow relative to the cheetahs, the cheetahs would drive that one extinct. So you wouldn't see them together. So I'm sorry I'm not putting it in uh, the language a lot of people would, but I actually am just, it's, it's second nature for me to start with the traits and the properties of the species and then ask the question about, well, how does this influence their position and their ability to interact in this food web that they live in? And to also think about interactions with multiple types of species at one time. That's the thing that sort of fascinates me. Uh, I, I, I think that it, it is not the language in itself important, because if it is not operational, then it is not important. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the possibility to have a, a much, uh, 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 to have a unified theory at a much higher level, okay? And a mechanistic one. Right. That's what we, we try to work out, for instance, in our book. So you can see there that uh, right there. yeah 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 but no one no one uses it so that's that's the problem 
and uh, and uh, so just to link this very so that therefore it is uh, uh, very exciting to look at your models and just link them uh, to the to the general theory because then you have this all the feedback looped uh, uh, just in front of you and then you can see that okay uh, in a general term how if you start from the general theory then uh, what comes out of it and then you will see that the same thing Right, right, correct. So, I, I mean, this is also why I, I've always worked on evolution in parallel with community ecology. Um, my work on the damselflies was always, I really thought of it as if I could go back 20 million years and look at the progenitor species of the two genera of damselflies I, work, I worked on in my career, can I predict why they differentiate from one another, how they fill in the various habitats that are available to them? And can I understand the properties of the traits of the species I see today based on selection pressures they would have experienced in the past? And so this is why with all these models, like Steve was saying, you know, we've also in parallel to this, taken these kinds of models and built an evolutionary component to them so that the parameters are based on the traits of the species and trying to understand what kind of traits would evolve, right? Yeah. You, can ask, you can ask the question about, well, what would it take for these species to coexist with one another? But evolution could really care less about whether they're coexisting. They just want that species in there. And so the evolutionary component of what I've always done has been, would natural selection result in species that would end up coexisting with one another? Yeah, it's um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah, yeah, we agree. Yeah, so if you want to look at stuff I've done on that, you could get my 2017 Princeton monograph. <laughs> okay, but I've made probably thirty dollars on those two books over the years, so. Uh, Check them out the library. The same. <laughs> <laughs> I even don't don't count it. <laughs> it's so few. Yeah, but well, we didn't do it uh, for uh, for money, of course. No, but just we wanted to see something uh, uh, unified and. Uh, well, like I said, I said I sent you fifty cents. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think we're out of time, so we should stop. But thank you again, Mark, for coming and uh, talking to us. And the next seminar, pleasure. thank you. The next seminar is on April 30th. It's going to be Evan Johnson talking about, uh, I guess, the prevalence of chaos and cycles in nature as opposed to in models. So that's the next talk. So uh, uh, stay tuned. We're going to be uh, sending out information in time. And until then, have a good rest of your day, evening, wherever you might be in the world. So thank you again and see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.